This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman, with Juan Gonzalez. As we spend the rest of the hour looking at how decades of U.S. military intervention in Central America has led to the migrant crisis of today, the majority of Central American refugees and immigrants to the United States come from just three countries, Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador, which are the same three countries the United States intervened in during, among other decades, the 1980s, on the sides of military governments and paramilitary death squads that killed tens of thousands, and in the case of Guatemala, hundreds of thousands of mostly indigenous people. In El Salvador, many soldiers responsible for carrying out the notorious 1981 El Mazote massacre, in which nearly a thousand unarmed villagers were killed, were elite U.S. trained forces. Between 1980 and 92, the U.S. sent over $4 billion in economic and military aid to El Salvador's government, nearly $1 million a day. Well, today we follow the story of one man and his family, and why he says the story of El Salvador is the story of the United States. Roberto Lavato is an award-winning journalist. He's just published his memoir, called Unforgetting, a memoir of family, migration, gangs and revolution in the Americas. He's joining us now from San Francisco, where he was born. Roberto, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Congratulations on this unforgettable memoir. But let's start with the title, Why You Call It Unforgetting. Uh, for anything, Amy, thank you. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be with Juan and you and the crew once again on uh, this joyous occasion for me that I've worn a red shirt for you that's in celebration and, and, and solidarity. And uh, I was going to have an, a gangster lean when you played that song uh, that I used to play in, like, in Lowriders and stuff. And so, um, but the, the, ter the term unforgetting comes from the Greeks. The Greeks uh, believe that when you went into the underworld, the dead, when the dead went into the underworld, uh, they had to cross the Lathe River, which was the river of forgetting, before going to either Elysium or Hades. And so, as I was, you know, trying to figure out a title for this book, I realized that um, the journey that I'd taken to all these different underworlds for the book, whether it was gang underworlds, uh, the underworlds of the, the FMLN guerrillas, uh, the underworld of my personal family history that was unknown to me in many ways, or my own psychology and and the underworld of, of, of migrants who have to kind of occupy an underworld existence in many ways. I just thought, wow, what a what a perfect, perfect way to kind of uh, bring up and excavate the, the, the truths that get hidden. Because in Greek, uh, in ancient, the ancient Greeks believed that unforgetting was also um, the, the term for truth, aletheia which means not Lathe River, unforgetting. And so I'm unforgetting uh, a history of not just El Salvador, but of the United States and of myself. And, you know, that my book is kind of a coming out for me personally, and I'll explain that as we go. Well, Roberto, you you begin the book uh, talking about uh, a tour you were giving in uh, 1992 in Los Angeles at the time <laughs> you were working with the the immigrant rights group got essing in, in Los Angeles, and you're touring around a foundation uh, a program officer, one of these people who decides whether to give money to worthy organizations. And and uh, you, you had very mixed feelings taking him around the the uh, the uh, Pico Union area of Los Angeles. There's a there's a sudden uh, shootout at one point. Uh, could you talk about that whole uh, part of your of your work uh, with Caresen? And also, what lessons might be drawn for a lot of activists today, uh, Black Lives Matter activists and, and prison reform activists, who are suddenly being courted by foundations who suddenly had discovered that they haven't been properly funding anti-racism uh, programs around the country? Well, that's a great question, Juan. I, uh, yeah, the, 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 the opening, the introduction of the book is 1992. Right after the LA riots had hit, we had foundations and corporations coming, and along with scholars, and it was just you know people interested in in post riot LA. And 
we were in MacArthur Park touring like we did. I was, I felt like, you know, I say at one point, I felt like, you know, you know, I was getting tired of being like Virgil to these uh, Dantes, you know, these aspiring Dantes wanting to see the underworld. And so uh, I'm showing this guy, uh, Leland, a uh, 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 MacArthur Park when I'm approached by an MS, by the first MS-13 member I ever met, this kid named Jose. And, um, you know, we were, and, and I, I, the, I could tell that the Leland was scared out of his wits, uh, like he was in a lion's den or something, and he was looking to me for security. And so I, I, I open it that way because it shows kind of the way that um, the whole issue of youth and urban youth and gangs even foundations and corporations will kind of shy away from us, as, as do legislators, including legislators of color here in California, uh, where the gangs were born, in fact, where MS-13 and, and 18th Street were born. Uh, and then uh, after they were born, they, they kind of adopted the structures of, of like the Mexican mafia. And so I'm there when this is starting to escalate and get more violent. And then... Uh, Attorney General William Barr, again, at the avatar uh, from the Bush administration, who's now in the Trump administration, deployed all these FBI resources to L.A. and other cities to start the gang war, which, you know, is, we see the products as we speak, right? And so then he also introduced the INS to then join the LAPD and law enforcement to deport the problem, the gang structures, to uh, El Salvador. You then go on in the book to, uh, in a, a, a subsequent chapter, to talk about your experience visiting uh, 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 immigrant families in detention in Carnes, Texas. And uh, could you talk about that and also this, this whole effort of the federal government to put these detention centers in the most out-of-the-way places so that even journalists have trouble getting to them? You know, this is an example of those underworlds I'm trying to get at. Like, a lot of people don't realize that, um, you know, those 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 immigrant prisons, I refuse to call them detention centers. It's a, an, it's a travesty to call them that. And I, all my fellow journalists, it's a travesty. Um, uh, you know, they, they put these prisons down in southern Texas precisely because immigrant rights groups won't go down there. It becomes harder for them to go down there, and it becomes harder for journalists, say, in San Antonio, to drive all these, you know, miles down south to visit these places. And they're actually ICE memos. And so my journey, my own journey begins when I meet a child and a mother who are plotting along with other immigrant women and children and youth to stage a protest against the awful conditions that moved some, for example, to mothers to slit their wrists or some children to try to hang themselves. And so, I mean, I was reluctant because my friends, uh, Ursula and Felipe, invited me to go to this, this prison. And I was kind of reluctant because I had this whole story from the war and other trauma I didn't even know that I, I had kind of stirring up in me. And I, w I knew I would eventually have to tell my story. And my basically, my bubble burst when a child tells me this really horrific story of what he saw in El Salvador. And at that moment, I realized, you know what? It's time to tell my story. It's time to come out, so to speak. And and, and I do. I come out about things that I, 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 was, I had known and things that I would learn and things that I needed to tell about myself, including my participation in the, in the, in the, in the revolutionary process in El Salvador. Can you talk about that, Roberto? Can you talk about your involvement with the FMLN? You're a well-known journalist in the United States. Talk about uh, who the FMLN were. Um, of course, now they're part of the regular political process and a party in El Salvador today. Um, but what decisions you made early on? Yeah, Amy, uh, you know, you, you as a journalist and Juan know very well that I wouldn't get Pulitzer grants if I said, hey, I was an urban commander with the FMLN. Uh, you know, that's just not how it works. You don't—what you have in journalism and in literature, I would argue, are not representative of the full spectrum of political, ideological, even racial, if you look at, like, Latinos, and not even Latinos on a race, but all the different sub-racial groups of Latinos are, like, less occupied, like, 1 percent of U.S. literature. So I uh, made a decision— after doing work with refugee communities in the in the war zones, uh, 
and working with refugees here in San Francisco with Carecen, Comité Refugiados Centroamericanos, and other groups like CISPES, et cetera, here to, to do solidarity and sanctuary work. I was becoming more conscious. I fell in love. There's a love story in my book, which is part of the point, right? Because all you hear is like terror is the given of the place, like Joan Didion. And I'm like, actually, no, I grew up Salvadoran. Love is the given of the place as well. And so uh, I, I, I'm in Chalatenango, El Salvador, uh, one of the most uh, difficult places I've ever seen in my life for the, uh, in terms of war. And I saw really terrible things, including things done to children. And I eventually say it's not enough for me to just do kind of like, well, kind of like what Juan's talking about, like nonprofit work and, and, and having all this language and getting all this funding like people do here uh, and other parts of the world. To, to be officially representing communities for very high salaries. I wasn't really feeling that, so I decided I needed to do something else. And I, I had some friends that introduced me to people in the FMLN, and, 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 and they thought I could be useful uh, working with urban commandos and logistics and things. And so uh, at that moment, when I see this, this home of the, that was bombed, with all these children, the moment I stopped being American, I stopped. You can go and look at most of my journalism. I avoid using the word American since 1991 because of, I didn't want anything to do with that. And so uh, I became an American with an accent on the E uh, uh, the, uh, and a citizen of the United States of America, which is kind of the, the revolutionary imaginary taking hold of me to, to, to want a better place. And the FMLN, again, and for people to understand, um, was the rebel fighting force at a time when the U.S. was pouring millions into the uh, military regime and the paramilitaries responsible for everything from the killing of the six Jesuit priests, their housekeeper and her daughter, uh, to the El Mazote massacre of 1981? Yes, yes. The FMLN was organized against a fascist military dictatorship backed by the U.S. government, beginning with the Carter administration. And if, you know, if you're a historian like my friend Joaquin Chavez, whose excellent book, uh, Poets and Prophets of the Revolution, is a, is a must read, um, you know, uh, you'll see that, you know, the U.S. involvement dates decades back. They started supporting El Salvador's military dictatorship starting in around 1934. Uh, when they finally recognized uh, Maximiliano Hernández Martínez, who perpetrated La Matanza of 1932, which histor some historians will tell you is one of the most violent episodes in, in not just Latin American history, but in world history, in terms of the numbers of people killed per day, uh, per week, in a concentrated place. And so uh, the FMLN was, you know, there were groups in the FMLN founded by poets. This is one of the things that attracted me to it, was that, you know, the, 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 the non-distinction between the poetic and the political between the the revolutionary and the and the and the and daily life between love and and labor and so um I I, I you know the FMLN was according to the CIA one of the most effective political military and social movements in Latin America in the 20th century where for example uh, you could read Nakla and see that one of every three Salvadorans was organized against the state in the, in the 1980s, according to the Universidad Centroamericana. And, you know, I mean, I, it, it taught me what it means to be a poet warrior. It's something that I think uh, we need right now, which is part of the reason I wrote the book, was to share, you know, there's all this dark, heavy stuff, but I think you'll find there's a lot of love, tenderness, and hope in the book, because that's the only way we got through as Salvadorans. And, and I think, as in all my experience around the world, in a most intimate way, I've never seen a people with such astonishing resilience as Salvadoreños. And, Roberto, uh, I, I, we have to break, but we're going to come back and also want to talk about your fraught relationship with your father and this revelation hmm. in your book that he was a young witness to La Matanza of 1932, the peasant uprising uh, in the government massacre, killings of thousands and thousands of Salvadorans. Roberto Lovato is the award-winning journalist. His memoir is just out. It's called Unforgetting. Stay with us. Our guest today is Roberto Lovato, the award-winning journalist, author of Unforgetting, a memoir of family, migration, gangs and revolution in the Americas. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Juan? 
Roberto, we, before break, you were men, uh, you were talking about mentioning La Matanza in 1932. A lot of people don't realize that the FMLN of the 70s and 80s took its name of Farabundo Martí, uh, Augusto Farabundo Martí, who was one of the organizers of the peasant uprising of 1932 and was also one of the founders of the Central American Communist Party. Could you talk about the links between what happened in 1932 and your understanding of it, as well as the development of the FMLN? Yeah, I mean, in my view and in the view of historians like uh, Aldo Laria, uh, Santiago, and Eric Ching, and, 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 and Greg Gould, um, uh, you know, it really should, the, the FMLN probably should have been named the Feliciano Ama uh, Frente Feliciano Ama por la Liberación Nacional, because it was primarily an indigenous uh, uprising, right? Uh, indigenous people started seeing their their kids, the little, the soft part of their head started sinking in, and 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 watching their kids die, and and they rebelled, and and there was also communist organizing with them, but really the the, the core groups of it and the, the the local leadership was in, indigenous. And so that that you know, and the way history works, oftentimes we we erase indigenous a a agency. And so I felt important to talk about how um, you know what hi historians have taught us the, about La Matanza that you know people rose up trying to overthrow the government. And what was the first communist insurrection? There were communists involved, including Farabundo Martí and and and, and, and a man named uh, El General. Uh, Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez saw an opportunity not just to take power because he was a vice president, but also then perpetrate uh, what scholars at Oxford have told me is uh, one of the single most violent episodes in world history, as far as the number of people killed per day in a concentrated space and per week in a concentrated space. And so, um, you know, there's a the the, the 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 records of La Matanza are were buried, burned, destroyed by and large. There, there's some and some historians in El Salvador are starting to reconstitute them and 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 rebuild the memory and and, and unforget, right? Because uh, you know, states are nothing if not manufacturers of am mass manufacturers of amnesia, and so um, you know, from that point on, you get military dictatorship, one of the longest standing military dictatorships in the Americas. But you also get one of the most consistent uh, left oppositions and effective left oppositions in the Americas, in the in, in the Salvadoran people's struggle, which is part of the reason I wrote my book, because those pathetic images of children crying and, and mothers screaming, the sounds, the sound bites of mothers screaming in places like Carnes are the dominant images, along with gangs of Salvadorans, when in fact you've got this incredible uh, uh, you know, astonishingly incredible political capability that the Salvadorans ha had and still have. So, La Matanza, you reveal in your book, talk about your father's connection as a witness. Yeah, my father, Ramon Alfredo Lovato Papamon, known to those of us who love him, uh, was uh, uh, nine years old when. Uh, this happened in January of 1932, and I, I didn't even know this. I was teaching uh, in the country's first Central American Studies program at Cal State Northridge, and we were trying to find books, which you can't find in English, except for a few, like the one by Gould and, and, and Sa Santiago. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I was, you know, doing research on La Matanza, and then I realized, hey, this town, Ahuachapan, is where my dad is from. It's one of the major centers, and my dad never said anything for, for decades. So then I start doing the research, and I finally asked my dad, and he reveals to me uh, that he had he had um, seen La Matanza, and it was a, a, an epic moment in my family history and in my own life because it explained a lot to me about why I was such a crazy kid that used to gangster lean like in that song and run in certain violent and kind of dangerous circles or join the FMLN and other crazy things that I've done in my life I had this deep undercurrent of family history that that I think a lot of us have in our families, family secrets. And I, I try to connect those family secrets to the secrets of nations, like with the Matanza, which was, again, covered up and buried, along with mass grave sites that are still unexcavated to this day. And speaking of, of family secrets, you also uh, 
revealed in your book that uh, your father, who had worked for United Airlines for many <laughs> years as a, a ramp service worker, also had his own uh, uh, underground life, uh, basically uh, in the Mission District of San Francisco, selling <laughs> contraband. Yeah, my dad was, along with Santana's father, involved in the contraband industry in San Francisco's Mission District. Uh, a lot of uh, colorful characters came out of there, and my dad was at the center of it. And my dad, a very smart guy, uh, created an, a transnational network of contraband, of uh, jewelry, uh, uh, electrodomestics, uh, calculators, perfume, um, eventually guns. My dad was running guns between El Salvador, or this San Francisco and El Salvador. Um, but he wasn't selling them to like the fascists or to the FMLN or anything. This was before in the pre-war year in the 70s. He was doing it to anybody who could afford it. But um, I learned about the construction of criminality at a very personal level. You know, I, 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 I had shame about my dad and I didn't uh, and my dad's activities. And, 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 and I started excavating the history. I find out it wasn't just my dad. It was my mama, te, my grandmother, who made pupusas with me, uh, for me, and, and our family. And with the same hands that she made pupusas, she also transferred. She was actually the originator of this transnational network of contraband that sustained our family. And so I'm not going to call my abuelita a criminal or my dad a criminal. I think there were people that were trying to uh, sustain their families by any ways they could, and under, under like, you know, for example, they lived through an El Salvador that didn't just see the matanza and the genocide, but a poverty that, in the Great Depression, that made Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath look like a, a wine festival. Finally, um, William Barr, the current Attorney General, <laughs> the Attorney General under George H. W. Bush. We just have a minute, but as you wrap up, Roberto, what is his connection to this story? William Barr, as Attorney General under the first Bush, redeployed FBI resources and the greatest deployment of FBI resources up to that point, uh, taking uh, FBI agents who were fighting foreign, you know, looking at foreign threats uh, and started focusing them on gangs. And then he starts looking at MS-13 and other gangs right after the L.A. riots. You can see he was he was there in, in, in L.A. And he, he started us on the path to eventually, like, militarizing the police uh, that we have right now. And then he then also had the INS deport the gang problem to El Salvador. And then he ex exported the after the war u.s style policing and, and and then i found out that military trainers from el salvador actually came to train lapd in counterinsurgency and and other police forces it's just when you start seeing the um robocopization of cop uniforms right and that we have now and, and william barr had everything to do with had a, not everything but he had a lot to do with this he i i i had to sing sing his his song because he deserves all the credit he deserves for what he did to El Salvador and to L.A. and to our national situation long before Trump. Roberto Lovato, there is so much more in this stunning memoir. Roberto is an award-winning journalist and author of Unforgetting, a memoir of family, migration, gangs and revolution. And that does it for our show. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Perk, Dean Augusta, Libby Rainey, Nermeen Sheikh, Mariana Tanasena, Carla Wills, Tammy Warnoff, I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Wear a mask, stay safe.